Okay, cool. So uh, this is the article. Um, so it's called Why Outbreaks Like Coronavirus Spread Exponentially and How to Flatten the Curve. Um, and so just to give a little background, uh, this was published uh, right at the time that these con this concept of social distancing was sort of entering uh, the public parlance. Um, so people were uh, uh, naturally very concerned about the spread of coronavirus in their countries. Um, and uh, nowhere, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but it was, it was definitely becoming a concern in the United States. And it was right at sort of an inflection point. Um, there were still a lot of people who uh, were downplaying the severity of the disease uh, or not understanding how social distancing could uh, disrupt its spread. And so um, this article, the purpose of it was just to demonstrate how uh, different strategies of uh, disrupting uh, the spread of something through a network could, could slow that spread down. Uh, so I'll just quickly uh, walk you through the article in case you haven't seen it. Um, so it starts off uh, with this chart, um, which just shows the number of cases uh, that had been officially reported in the United States um, from January 22nd when our first case was, was reported in Washington state uh, through March 13th, which was the day before the article was published. And obviously now uh, we have more than 1.5 million uh, reported cases in the United States uh, a little too, about two months later. Uh, so that's like almost three orders of magnitude greater than what it was at the time. But um, if you were to look at a curve now, uh, you'd, you'd still see a, a similar pattern um, in terms of cumulative cases of the sort of exponential growth. And that's really what the article sought to explain was like, why do we have this property of exponential growth uh, in networks? Um, one thing that I want to note is in the following article, this is the only actual and actual I put in quotes data that you'll see. And I put it in quotes because uh, as I'm sure you all know, the data, the official data uh, that we have about COVID-19 is wrong everywhere. Um, and that's not because of some kind of nefarious scheme on the part of our elected leaders or anything like that. It's just because um, it's impossible to know how many cases there are. Uh, one property of this disease is that um, it's quite common for there to be uh, asymptomatic or uh, mild cases. And when I say mild, I don't mean mild in the sense that you're not going to feel anything, like you might get really sick still, but uh, you wouldn't be sick enough to go to a doctor or a hospital and therefore you wouldn't get tested. Uh, so no matter what the case count is, you know, usually you can multiply it by about five to get the, uh, to get the real case count. And that would be assuming that everybody who has a serious case is getting tested, um, which of course is not the case. Uh, in many places there are not enough tests for everybody. And then of course, even if everybody was getting tested, uh, there are a lot of uh, false negatives. And so even then you wouldn't know the actual number of cases. And then that's not to mention the possibility for deliberate disinformation. So uh, using the real COVID-19 data is fraught. And um, so this is just a situation where we have a lot of data, but uh, none of it's reliable. And so what I wanted to do with this article was not to use the real data. And so all of the data that you're going to see in the below article is generated within the browser itself uh, as you read the article. Um, okay, so we have th this curve here is not about, it's not really about the real data. It's just to demonstrate what an exponential growth curve looks like. Uh, and so uh, I reinforce it here. Um, with uh, this little data word, um, it's kind of like a spark line in inline text, uh, just reinforcing that this shape is this exponential curve, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, okay, so uh, the way that I chose to do that is by using these uh, simulations of uh, people or dots interacting in a community. And uh, so I wanted to introduce sort of the general dynamics of how this is gonna work. And the first thing that I wanna note is that, like this is a metaphor um, that is not accurate in terms of the way that people actually interact, right? Like when you meet your friend in the street, 
uh, unless you have a very re strange relationship with your friend, uh, you don't meet each other and then immediately move off in the other direction. Um, this is not how real people interact, but uh, the purpose of these simulations is not to uh, represent reality or to try to model the disease dynamics of COVID-19. Um, it's just to explain how network effects work. And because of that, because it's, a, it's gonna be a fake disease and because it's supposed to be simple simulations, not reality, um, it gives me sort of the freedom to use the visual metaphors that I think are most effective. And so when they bounce off of each other, uh, you notice it, like your eye is attracted to these collisions. And uh, so it's much easier to follow what's going on. Um, so what I wanted to do is just sort of uh, gradually introduce how the simulations are going to work. Uh, so the first one is uh, just people who are sick making healthy people sick. Um, also, again, this is not realistic, right? Like this would be a preposterously virulent disease if it were to uh, immediately infect a healthy person as soon as you know the slightest interaction took place. But uh, but again, like this this metaphor is more vivid than the reality, right? Like if some of the dots were not to get sick or some of the dots got sick later after uh, an incubation period, uh, it would be harder to follow with your eye. And so I'm just trying to uh, make it as simple as possible so that people can follow what's going on. Um, another thing that I wanna note is I have uh, inline uh, legend. So um, sometimes we call this a key for free. Um, so rather than having to put your legend uh, next to the visualization, uh, sometimes it's nice to just put your legend right in line with the text. And uh, so that lets people, you know, just continue to read the story and also understand what everything represents. Uh, okay, so that's sort of the basic dynamics. You're going to have balls bouncing off of each other. And I also wanted to introduce this idea that uh, people can recover from this disease uh, that we're calling simulitis. Uh, again, like I'm taking some creative license, right? Because uh, a lot of people, of course, don't recover from uh, real diseases and they die. Um, but in this case, you know, just to keep it simple and less morbid, uh, I didn't want to kill off any of the dots. Um, also, you know, there's some debate over whether people who uh, actually get COVID-19 uh, might be able to get it again in a mutated form. That is not a property of simulitis. And again, that's just for simplicity's sake. Um, and, and so I had to make it clear uh, at several points throughout the course of the article, uh, just reminding people that like, this is not COVID-19, this is a fake disease called simulitis. Uh, because even though the metaphors are, uh, uh, or, or even though it's an uh, extreme simplification, uh, the metaphors are close enough to reality that people still would confuse simulitis with COVID-19. Uh, okay, so now that I have these basic simulations that explain how the disease dynamic works, uh, we can go to our first actual simulation. So we just have all of these uh, people, you can think of them as people uh, or, or circles in a, in a town, uh, they starting off at uh, random angles and random positions. Um, so every time that you look at this in your browser, it's going to be a little bit different, uh, but these growth curves are going to be the same. So I just want to make a few comments about um, some of my design decisions here. Um, the first thing to note is that it plays automatically when you scroll to it. So let me just reload the page. Um, so it hasn't started, but as soon as I scroll to it, it starts. And uh, this is really important to have this happen um, because uh, what experiments show is that generally speaking, um, if readers, if, if your article doesn't work or your interactive or your graphic doesn't work unless the reader interacts with it, then generally speaking, your article is not going to work. Uh, people don't uh, usually interact with your graphics in the way that you want them to. Um, you know, even if you have a big arrow pointing at something saying, click this, like people still won't click it. And, you know, even if it's 1% um, of your readers that don't click it, you know, that's a big problem. Um, but probably it's going to be more than half of your readers that aren't clicking it. And so they're not going to get anything out of it. So it has to start scrolling or has to start playing as, as soon as they scroll to do it. Um, another thing that I want to note is that 
uh, I'm not inventing any new visual forms here. Um, so other than the simulation, which is really easy to follow, like what's going on, um, uh, there are two graphical elements here. Uh, one of them is a table. The table just has three rows and two columns. So you know, nothing could be simpler than that. And then it has this uh, area chart, um, which is a very familiar form to most people. And it's you know, fairly simple to understand how to read it. And what I wanna say about this is that a lot of times I think um, data visualization practitioners like to try to create new visual forms. Um, because it's fun and because it's uh, a challenge to sort of push the field forward. Um, but one of the drawbacks of that is that you need to train your reader how to read the graphic before they can understand the content, um, right? So in other words, they can't learn the content until they learn the form. And so that's going to make it harder for them to understand what you're trying to communicate. Uh, and so if you can leverage some knowledge that they already have, so in this case, like they already understand these types of charts, that's going to be easier for you to communicate what you want to communicate. Uh, okay. And then, so just very briefly, um, we can move through, uh, now, now that people understand the basic dynamics of how this works, that like everybody gets really sick really fast and starts to recover. Um, you know, we can kind of mess with the simulation and show different ways to disrupt these network effects. So uh, here we have a attempted quarantine. Uh, so everybody on the left side is getting sick until the quarantine breaks and then everybody on the right side gets sick. And so you have this sort of big second wave um, that happens. Uh, and so it's nice to be able to see the change in the simulation over time so that you can see how these different, uh, different strategies to disrupt the network effect um, change how the disease spreads over time. And of course, it's going to be a little bit different every time because it's random, but uh, the basic patterns are going to be the same. And again, of course, like this is not realistic, you know, it's not actually how a quarantine would work in many ways, but it still is close enough to communicate the point that if your quarantine fails and you have no other um, strategies available to uh, slow down the spread, um, you, you know, you're going to have everybody getting infected. Um, and I think it's also worth noting here that like, you don't even need to think of these network interactions as a, as a disease. Like it could be a, a meme spreading on social media and, or, or an idea, you know, a persuasive idea spreading through society. And it's interesting to me, in fact, that we use the language of disease to describe uh, anything that spreads through a network, right? So when a meme is really popular, we say that it goes viral. So we're really, um, the, the, the language of disease and the language of networks are kind of inextricably linked to each other. Uh, so I just think that's a, I don't know, interesting observation. Uh, so anyway, we see that the quarantine doesn't really work out. And uh, then we have finally uh, this attempt at social distancing. So this is where, you know, basically you just tell three quarters of the circles to stop moving. And, uh, you know, pretty quickly the, uh, the effect of, or the disruption of the network is, is, uh, is shown very clearly here. Um, and so this was right at a time, the story was published right at a time when social distancing was uh, just becoming part of the common parlance. And uh, so I think people were understanding sort of in theory why it was important. Uh, but these simple metaphors, I think, were, were fairly effective in illustrating um, how, how social distancing can disrupt uh, these network effects. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I wanted to show that with some, some social distancing is good, but uh, even more social distancing is better. So now only an eighth of the dots can move. And uh, well, you have uh, a much better um, outcome in terms of how many people get sick. Uh, so that, that's really the whole idea. You know, it's pretty simple, um, but uh, I think it really succeeded in communicating this idea of like how social distancing can disrupt network effects. 
And then at the bottom, we have uh, a comparison of your results. So it's easy to, to see, um, you know, how the different strategies performed. And you know, this is a really powerful um, ability of data visualization is to enable people to make comparisons very quickly. Um, and then, you know, we, so we have a discussion that ends the article. Um, I also just wanted to mention a little bit about uh, how I got the ideas for this article. Um, and basically, it, it just came from uh, my own experiments with uh, collision detection. So like two years ago, I was just working on like how to get circles to bounce off the borders of a browser window. Um, so this was literally, I, I published this code uh, uh, I think on like March 16th, 2018. So like two years before. And this is kind of fun. Like I wanted to see, you know, what would happen if you slowed them down and sped them up, uh, made them bigger and smaller. But that's really all I was doing. And then uh, later on, like I, I got into the collision detection thing. Um, but all of these experiments I made with without any idea of like a story in mind. Uh, so I think that the the lesson here, and this happens a lot in my work um, at, as a journalist, is that like I do a lot of this coding and data visualization stuff for fun, and um, it's just sort of like one of the nice things if you have a job that you like um, is is that like you, you might end up spending time away from work, kind of doing the same thing, but then leveraging those things that you learn for your actual like paid job. Um, so, you know, my general philosophy is like, no work is wasted. You know, here I am two years ago making circles bounce off of each other just for fun. And, you know, then I get to, um, use that to make an article in the Washington post. So, you know, you never know how your, um, experiments are going to pay off, but, uh, you know, that's not really the point. You know, the point is just to do them, to learn and, and to hopefully have fun. And then, you know, maybe you get to use them someday. Um, and, and the last thing I want to mention is that uh, so after the article was published, I got some uh, some emails from readers who uh, wanted to know like how it how it worked. Um, all this code is published, by the way, on uh, blocks.org, so you can you can check it out for yourself. But anyway, so one guy who's like a computer scientist asked me um, if I knew about spatial index structures um, because it can speed up your collision detection algorithms, right? So like in this one, basically you have to compare the position of every uh, node to every other node on each tick. Um, and so as you add nodes to the simulation, uh, it grows like uh, quadratically in terms of the amount of time it takes for you to run the simulation. So it's computationally very expensive. Uh, this one also is, but uh, but so you can see I have way more nodes here, but this is actually using a quad tree, which is like a spatial index structure. So rather than having to compare every node to every other node, uh, you only compare them to a certain amount of nodes. And you can see that with this one, which I think has 500, um, there's very little lag, like almost 60 frames per second. Um, and I know that there are ways to improve this, but anyway, the point is that even after I published the article, the experimentation doesn't stop, you know, you still try to make it better. Uh, okay, so I've, I know I've used up my time. Um, I could talk a lot.